Ruch welcome. Here we are. This is our 20th Torah portion, I believe, for this year. And the triennial parasha is called Veha Elohim Nisa. Then God tested, or something more like extremely tested. Let's just start with the prayer. Avinu Malkeinu, Modeim Anachnu Lefanecha, Ki Anachnu Yodeim Et Shimcha. Tishlachna Hayom Et Ruach HaKodesh, Bebakasha, Aleinu, Ki Anachnu Yochalim Lilmol Tov Bayinecha. Ki Nirabzon Ki Kol HaShomea Et Koli, Ki Gihye Lahem Belevavam, Divrecha Adonai. Toda lecha, l'schut Yeshua HaMashiach. All right. So in the triennial cycle, today we have two chapters. This is the biggest parasha we've had so far for a triennial reading. Chapters 22 and 23. And the Haftarah is Isaiah 33, 7 and onward. So as we've kind of started a new custom, let's look at the ancient Westminster Leningrad Codex, this thousand-year-old document, which is a complete Hebrew Bible with almost fully intact Masora, that's the Masoretic Notes, as well as all of the Ta'amin, that's the accent marks, and the Nikodim or Nikodot, it's called both ways, the, the vowel signs. And here you can see, here's the Samech, this stands for Sedra, it's marking the Sedra, the section of reading, which was read in ancient times, as we're doing now, three and a half year cycle. And it says, Vayhi acharei hadevayim ha'ele. So it came to pass after these things. And then here is where we get the name of the Torah portion. Veha Elohim Nisa et Avraham. That the God severely tested Avraham. And here we have an easier way to read. We have the beginning of our parsha, and we have the chapter number with Hebrew numerals instead of Arabic numerals. And so you should be learning by now that Kaf represents anything in the 20 series. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. And then we go to Lamed, the next letter in the alphabet. Right? So the Kaf here is a 20. And the Beit, Aleph Beit, it's the second letter in the alphabet, so that's the number 2. So this is chapter 22. Okay, let's look here. Vayhi, achir ha'devarim ha'ele. So it was after these things. Veha Elohim nisa et Avraham. That the God nisa. He, nasa means to test. Nisa strengthens it a bit. This is a PL form. It means there's a, usually the PL verbal form, the binyan as we call it in Jewish grammar, it strengthens the meaning. Sometimes it's a causative effect through strengthening, but it strengthens the meaning of the basic root of the verb. So if nasa is to test, and interestingly enough, it's related to the noun nes, which is like a sign. When God gives us a nace or a banner, it can mean a banner. If an, if an army is carrying its carrying a nace on a flag or a degel, it's a it's a sign. Or a, you see the victorious, you see your your comrade's banner coming over the hill. That's good in in, in battle, right? But nisa, since this is in the pl, the intensive or the the dishtam, as the grammarians call it, it implies a difficult test. He's, this is why many translations will put it like, put Avraham to the test. You can't always bring these things into English easily, or eloquently rather, right? In Hebrew, it's one word, right? Nisa. And this implies he, he gave him a difficult test. Not just, you know, hey, give me some lip service. Whom do you choose this day? <laughs> we choose you. Or, 
Say the magic words. We believe in Yeshua. Yay, done. No, he tested his faith. He put his faith through the crucible with one of the most difficult tests any human being could possibly be given. Now the word order here is also interesting. Usually in Hebrew, in SBH, we call it Standard Biblical Hebrew. And Standard Biblical Hebrew, which means not poetry or wisdom literature, uh, and not necessarily the later prophets. Right? This is Torah Hebrew, Standard Biblical Hebrew, and it goes into the early prophets. Kings, Samuel, uh, Judges, these types of things. Joshua. We have the verb first, so Nisa should be first. It should be over here first. The fact that the subject of the verb, the person doing the thing, i.e. Ha Elohim, the God, the fact that this is first, this means there is special emphasis on it, right? So, again, kind of hard to bring across in English without sounding strange. You know, so if I was reading this and I wanted to bring across what Hebrew is saying, I'd probably say something like, then the God put Abraham to the test, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to do, else to do it, intonationally wise, right? You have to, English, the word order, if we change the word order, it doesn't do much, right? And sometimes it just makes it confusing. Word order is very important in English. Right? But in Hebrew, sometimes we can move it, but when you move it out of the standard, there is a purpose for doing that. In this case, that purpose is to say, to emphasize who is testing Avraham. It is not just the Satan. It is God himself. Now, from the Talmud, Tractate Megillah, page 31, on the first side of the page, it says, and nowadays, when there are two days of Rosh Hashanah, right, so Jewish New Year, on the first day, they read Genesis 21. That's a chapter before this. In accordance with the opinion cited as some say, and on the next day, they read, they read, and God tested Abraham, right? So remember, we didn't have chapters and verses, right? So really, before the chapters were added to the Bible by non-prophets, this whole section we would we would have called it right? so this is the significant part after these things this is not so significant so you call it by the first significant line so this was not chapter 22 it was the halohim nisa et avraham in order to mention the merit of the binding of isaac on the day of god's judgment and they read as the haftarah is ephraim my dear son that's the Talmud truck at Megillah. So this is a very quintessential section of scripture. Uh, many Jews say, they recite this in the Shachrit service daily. They read through the whole chapter 22. Right? And so this is something you very quickly become accustomed with. Even if your Hebrew isn't so great, if you're going to shul and you're actually praying the Siddur or praying the Siddur at home, you're going to really get this embedded pretty quickly. So that it'd be kind of hard not to understand the Hebrew, right? After going through it again and again and again. Unless you're just like a robot and don't care. <laughs> Et Avraham. He tested Avraham. Swarno comments that on this phrase, he saw it Avraham, to demonstrate that Avraham's love for God, as well as his fear of God, was not merely potential, but actual. You know, those of you who have visited churches and various denominations I'm sure you've seen this or if you just have friends who are Christians or whatever I'm sure you've seen this sort of thing this they have a potential fear of God and a potential this works better if you know science right if you studied physics like potential energy it's just a quick physics lesson if you have a big bag of sand on the ground we would say its potential energy in physics is zero, right? Like it's not gonna, it's not going to impact anything around it, right? With the idea of motion, right? There's nowhere to fall to. But if you put the big bag of sand up on top of a house, it has a high potential energy. Because then if it falls, you know, it could break somebody's neck, right? So the potential changes into kinetic energy. It's moving. It's actually got energy now, right? It's not just a potential. It just works in chemistry as well, but I, we're not going to get into all that. So, so you have potential and you have <coughs> the actualized, the actualized energy. 
So this is very interesting because this is how Swarno is viewing this, this context. He says this concept with putting Abraham to the test. He says to demonstrate Abraham's love for God as well as his fear of God was not merely potential. It's not like many of our, our Goyim friends and ourselves included. We all struggle with this. I'm not picking on the Goyim here. We need to make sure that it is not just potential, but actual, that the actualized, there's actually energy happening with our faith and with our fear. Much as God's goodness is not merely potential, but actual. How would it be if God replied back to us in the same manner that we often treat him? Yeah, it's lip service. I fear of God. Yeah, I fear God. Yeah, praise God. You know, Hosanna to the highest, you know, and all this kind of stuff. No. <laughs> if What if God just did that? Yeah, I love you, but, you know, maybe I'll do something in a bit for you. Wait a while. Wait a while. Wait, wait and see. The purpose, Sforno writes, of man's existence is to emulate the virtues of God. And by means of this test, Avraham had an opportunity to demonstrate this. When God created man, he had set himself the objective of, quote, let us make man in our own likeness, etc. I.e., or here, image, it says, right? As much like divine beings as it is possible for a creature to be. And we've talked about this before, the idea that we are his imagers, right? That we are his imagers, we're made to be his imagers, that's Betselem, Elohim, and also Dumato in his likeness, right? So we are his imagers, we're the office holders of God here on earth, which means we represent the divine will in our daily life. And if more believers would take this seriously to understand what it means to be an imager of God, like Sforno's pointing out, so that you do not have just potential faith, potential fear but you actualize it like the sandbag falling down to break the neck of the wicked you we, we actually act out our faith with fear and trembling like the brother the messiah puts it how much better would this world be Vayomer alav then he said to him avraham Vayomer he named me and he said here am i he named me this is the way that the righteous answer, answer the call to the Lord. When he calls on us, we say, he named me. If you recall, if you've ever read, or maybe you haven't read, but in the book of 1 Shemuel, 1 Samuel in the Bible, in the, in, this is in the Nach, in the Nevi'im, in the prophets, Samuel is a young boy, and Hannah, who received the, the miraculous birth, she gave him to Adonai. That is, she took him to the, the Mishkan at Shiloh so that he could help the priests who were there. And he himself was also a Levi. He's a Levi, right? His father is a Levite. So he goes to the father, the, pre, the, the tribal lines. And in the night, the story goes on to say that Shemuel heard a voice saying, Shemuel, Shemuel. And he gets up and he goes to Eli, the, the, the chief priest, and he says, you called Adoni? You called my Lord? And he says, no, I didn't need anything. I was asleep. Go back to bed. And it happens again. Shemuel, Shemuel. And he gets up and he goes to see Eli. You called my Lord? And he says, no, I didn't. And finally, after this goes on for a while, Eli realizes, and we're, we're, by the way, we're told before the story begins that, that the voice of the Lord was not heard so often in those days anymore, right? His, he had been diminished. But Eli remembers the days when he used to hear from the Lord. And he says to him, okay, my son, he realizes it's Adonai calling to Shemuel. It's a prophetic calling, a prophetic voice. He says, next time you hear the voice, tell him, your sir, here I am. Right? He named me. This is, a, this is the main portion of how he's to respond. And so the same is how we should respond. If you feel a calling or if you're just going throughout your daily business and an image flashes in your mind, <coughs> something that maybe you don't want to do that maybe you should do, or you have a gut feeling in your stomach, you can answer the call and check if it's a shem by saying, Hineni, here am I. It's actually really hard to translate into English. Hineni means something more like, here am I now, right? Here and now. The Hine, it means here, now. But we don't really have a word for this in English. I don't know if anyone listening in your language, if you have something like this. So Hine, here, now. Here, now, am I. The idea is like as of a soldier, attentive and ready to act immediately on the orders. And so this word here, let me colorize it there in the Hebrew. 
Hineni should be really how we live out our lives. Anytime the call comes, some of us, we push away the call. We don't want to hear it. I don't want that inconvenience in my life. Leave me alone. <laughs> I want to make some loot. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Stop bothering me. Even though we might not respond in so many words, our actions are, of course, as the as the idiom goes, much louder than words. He named me. He named me. Here am I. You can see the form in other forms. He named the You know, here are you, or behold you, something like this. But he named me is the one we should internalize. If you don't know any other Hebrew words, then take this one with you today. He named me. Here now am I. Yes, Dr. Devera comments on the Nisa that it's to prove, to test slash demonstrate his faith. Exactly. Exactly. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. Let me get my laser pointer back. Vayomer, kach na et bincha, et yechidecha, Asher hafta et Yitzchak velech lecha el Eretz Hamoria. And he said, so this is God speaking, Kachna, take now. Na means now. Take now. Although some say that the Na softens a request. And this is certainly true. When we ask Hashem for something, we say Na. Right? If you pray in biblical Hebrew instead of in modern, instead of Bavakasha, we say Na. Na, as in please. Please. It makes the request softer. So some commentators from the Mikra Gedolot, they have the concept that, that by making it softer, that Hashem is actually saying to Abraham, you don't have to do this. Right? I won't kill you if you don't do this. Right? So that it truly is Abraham's choice to serve and do the thing. So when we speak to Hashem, it's please, and when he says it to us, it's softening the request. But with Na, there is this idea of now. Just like he nay can be here now, not can be please now. Kachna et bincha, your son. Et yechidecha, your yachid son. Asher hafta, whom you love. The one who's called Yitzchak. So let's look at yachid. I've taught this in the past, right? So I don't want to, I won't go in as much depth as we did before. Just... There are some new people, so I'd like to teach the new people, and I'd also like to remind, refresh those of you who maybe don't remember this in such detail. So we'll go maybe half detail on the Yahid. So let's take a look here at Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, or some like to call this the book of Messianic Jews. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. And there's even some midrashim that, that Avram did actually kill Isaac, and that God did raise him from the dead. I think at the very least, this is what Avram expected would happen, his hope knowing that God is not cruel, that surely at the age of 100 he would not have given me a son just so that I could slaughter him. And then that's the end of it. Surely this good God whom I know, whom Abraham is a friend of, realized that this was not going to be the end. So this word yachid, literally it means one. But the nuance is different in the Hebrew. It's different. The Septuagint, Ralph's edition, translates it as agapites, beloved, beloved. And uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to put in here the story about Yiftach, but I was worried we wouldn't have time to go on that level of depth. But depth. But just a quick overview. Do you remember Yiftach in the book of Judges? Yiftach is a judge who was born to a prostitute, but but so he doesn't really have a lot of Torah learning, right? But he does, he is eager to help his people, he is eager to, to serve Hashem. And he prays to Hashem and he says he makes a nader, a, a vow, right? Remember, a nader is different from an oath. A nader 
is it's like an oath that only it's a it's, it's a potential oath we could say a nader is a potential oath it's not actualized until god does what what is required, what is requested. So the person says to God, if you do this for me, I will do this for you, right? It's kind of a tit for tat sort of thing. A quid pro quo, right? If you do this, then I will, whatever, read Psalms 200 times a day or whatever, whatever your oath is, your neither is. But it only happens if the creator answers his side of the bargain, right? And so Yiftach, he makes an oath. If you help me defeat this enemy army, these pagans, if, I, if I'm victorious, then when I come home, whatever comes out of my house, I will offer up to you as, an, as an, a whole burnt offering. Right? And he's victorious, and he comes home. And I imagine they might have had one of these houses that's, uh, you know, sometimes the barn can be part of the house, right? The part that the animals can come in to get out of the rain. So he's probably thinking a sheep or something's going to come out, right? But instead his daughter comes out. And... And in the Hebrew, he says, ha ha, you know, you can tell the pain in his voice. His daughter comes out, not only comes out, she comes out dancing and singing, right? Can you imagine how cute? She's so happy that daddy's home. And the text was on to tell us that she is his bat, his daughter, yechida, yechida, the feminine form of this verb right here, yechida, his beloved daughter, his agapites, but not just that, his only daughter, his only child, in fact, he had no sons. Just, this was a single child, and she's the one that comes out. And so now Yiftach, he thinks he has to honor the vow and, and kill his daughter. Right? So if you don't know the story, go check out in Judges. We don't have the time to go into any more detail or into all the commentary about the sages saying, oh, Pinchas was there, he could have annulled it. And, you know, why, you know but Pinchas didn't want to lower himself to talk to an Amha'ar, it's an ignoramus. And this guy, because he's like a king, he thought, who am I to go to the priest? In, in, in short, if you've made a vow which is stupid, you can have... A scholar can annul your vow, all right? This is what Chazal teaches. A scholar, or even if it's, it's, if it's questionable, then a group of two or three Torah-educated people can come together and they can annul vows, right? So if you made a stupid vow and you think you're trapped in your vow and there's no way out of it, then, you know, send us a message and let's see. We can probably, we can probably, it's probably annullable, right? And some vows are even illegal vows. Yiftach's vow was an illegal vow. It's not kosher. You can't make a vow like that. You can't make a vow, I vow to sin. I, I vow to murder my child and <laughs> to do a, a whole burnt offering, which we're not allowed to do at that time. In Abraham's day, the Torah had not yet been given. That's why this was not an impossible command for God to tell him to take your son, your yachidcha, your, literally your only one, right? And as I said, this word has a different nuance. It's beloved. His beloved. The same word is used in the Psalms to, re to refer to the psalmist's soul. The soul, poetically, is referred to as Yechida, just like the daughter of Yiftach. Yechida, it's, it's my precious essence of being, right? The idea being it's the part of me that, that allows the animation of my body. <laughs> it's, it's the part of me, depending on how you look at it, if it neshama, it's a part of me that will survive, right? And that I'll be given a reinvigorated Yechida, in the day of the resurrection. Now what's interesting is the apostolic writings, when they reference his story, they go along with, there's, there's other versions of the, of the Septuagint. I was quoting Ralph's. So there's other versions. Septuagint has many, many different flavors, right? And in fact, there's the, uh, the uh, Göting, was it Göttingen? There's a the Göttingen Septuagint, right? Which is... Uh, it was this, I think, 56 years work to collate all the different versions of the Septuagint that they had found out there, right? With a critical commentary, like, you know, which copies say which, such and such, like this. So it's, it's not as together as the Hebrew Bible is, which is why it's really odd that sometimes some Christian translations, they choose to translate their, their Tanakh the, the quote Old Testament from the Septuagint, leaning just on Septuagint, right? Not as a secondary information on the Hebrew, right? When really the Septuagint is very fragmented. There are many, 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 many different versions out there. And uh, because it wasn't treated with the same kind of regard that the Hebrew is, right? Whereas the Hebrew, very few differences from manuscript to manuscript, right? Usually spelling errors, something like this. 
So in some of the versions of Septuagint, and also in the apostolic writings in the Greek, we, we actually have this word, monogenes, is what Yahid maps to. Monogenes. And so I have here an entry, part of the entry from BDAG, which is the premier scholarly lexicon for, for quote-unquote first century Christian writings, right? Meaning the, the, the apostolic writings and the early church fathers, right? By the way, I'm not saying to read early church fathers because a lot of them were anti-Semites, but nevertheless, they wrote in this kind of Greek. And so the first meaning is pertaining to being the only one of its kind with any specific relationship. And the second definition is pertaining to being the only one of its kind or class, i.e. unique in kind of something that is the only example of its category. This makes a lot of sense when we understand that Avraham had two sons, right? So how silly would it be if if Ha Elohim, if the God, is speaking in English to Abraham, he says, Abraham, take your only son, the way that many English Bibles render this word, and it just loses the nuance. And it also opens up the door for critics, right? I mean, when your kids go away to university and they get surrounded by leftist liberal professors and all the lefties that go to school, and this is when a lot of children, they lose their faith. If they go away to college, they lose their faith then. And you might tell them because they're, they're now adults and blah, blah, blah. Well, they've been adults for a while, usually by the time they go to college. It's more than that. It's, there's a, it's, an, it's an intellectual onslaught that happens. Goodness, I remember when I was a student at Boston University, in, in my math classes, I had to deal with this garbage. Math. I had a linear algebra professor that used to always work in atheism into his class. And finally, I just let him know, when, hey, can we talk about math instead of your feelings on religion? You know, just like, who are these people to think that they can inculcate our children with these types of values? And then there were the history professors who always inserted their nonsense and with weird theories about Israel really, really belonging to the Arabs and all this kind of stuff. And so if a kid goes to college and is going to keep his faith, he's going to be hated by the professors, which can affect your grades, you know. Usually the leftists don't have very great morality. So it's useful to know these things. The English Bible is not exactly correct. It's not really saying just your only son. What it's saying is your significant son, right? The son of the promise, the son who's special, the son who is unique in that he was miraculously born. A womb was created in his mother just for him at an old, old age. Like Dr. Heiser likes to call it the species unique son. That he's unique among his class. This leads to other mistranslations, in this case, in the apostolic writings. For a long time, the etymology of this word, monogenes, this Greek word, was not understood. Grammarians thought it was mono. It's monos, usually, but monos, meaning one, right, or only, right, like monopoly, right, and genes, the second word was from a Greek word, ginomai, they thought, which means to come into existence, to existence. Sorry, that was kind of some sloppy writing there. I'm trying not to touch the screen. But we found this is not true. It's actually, as we see here from the b entry, monos plus genos, not from genomai. Genos. <laughs> genos. So genos is actually where we get the English cognate genos. Genos, genos, as in biology, is a classification. For example, mammalia, right? We have the genus mammalia, which are every animal that has hair and four appendages and two eyes, and there's some other classification traits, right? Like chimpanzee and dog, right? They're both mammals. They both have four appendages, fur, right, or hair, two eyes, etc., right? And so uh, some have a tail, some don't, right? So that's but they're still in the same genus, right? And then lower than genus, you get other types of way to organize and classify. 
But it, in Greek, it didn't have this exact meaning. In Greek, it's more like species, we say in English, right? When you, when you take a root from one language and you bring it to the other, oftentimes you don't get the exact result that you're thinking of, that you're expecting, right? So, so when your Bible says that Yeshua is the only begotten Son of God, that's because it's an old translation you're looking at, and they didn't have all the scholarship, and they thought that's what this word meant. It's a false etymology. It's a false historical meaning of the word. Now we know that it means Yeshua is the Yahid of God. He's the Yahid. He's the species unique son of God because God has other sons, right? The Bnei Elohim, the sons of God. He has other children, but this one is unique. Yeshua is unique in the same way that Yitzchak was unique. There's miraculous. Just as Yitzchak Yitzhak's birth was miraculous, and just like the prophet Shemuel's birth was miraculous, so too the birth of the Messiah was miraculous. There was no human father in this case. So it's different than the other two miracles, where there was a human father, but the woman had been barren. In this case, Miriam was not barren, but she had never slept with a man. And so that's the miraculous aspect of it. So that is why Yeshua is the monogamous. Monogamous. Okay? Write some of the stuff. That's fine. You don't need that note. And get yourself up and go to the land of Moria, and offer up him there. The Alehu. This whole thing means and offer him up. Like it means as an as a whole burnt offering. There, for an Ola for a whole burnt offering. Alachad heharim on one of the mountains. Asher Omar, which I will tell you. Elecha, tell to you. According to Ibn Ezra, the temple was later built on this mountain. Not just Ibn Ezra, this is kind of common knowledge. This is explicitly stated in scripture. Now he's quoting, he actually combines two different verses into one new verse. <laughs> I've done that before. So Solomon built the house on Mount Moriah. And then here's the comment of the verses it comes to. They come from. It was not a very tall mountain. The threshing floor of Arauna, the Yebusit, was on it. Congratulations, you finished this part. If you want to stand with us financially, please visit our Patreon.com address listed on the screen. Another way to help is by subscribing to our channel and hit the bell so you get notifications. Or you can like it with a thumbs up. This helps us as well as leaving a comment down below. All these things help show YouTube how important these teachings are. If you'd like to get involved in our yearly Hebrew reading of the prophets and the writings, contact us below and we'll let you know how you can do that. Kol hakavod Ladonai. All the glory is to Adonai.